If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 5. And we're going to start reading in verse 13. We'll read 13 through 15 this morning. And we have a tradition at West Conroe where we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And so I'm going to ask if you would join me by standing. And let's again honor the reading of God's Word in this way. So Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. It says, Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather I indeed come now as a captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he bowed down, and he said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, some of you know this about me, but many of you do not, and that's that I have dyslexia. And as a young boy, uh, it would often cause me to get behind in my schoolwork, and it caused me a lot of embarrassment. And uh, that embarrassment led to a lot of fear in my life as well. But fortunately, I had some great educators in my life who came along beside me, and they developed uh, a skill set to help me with my reading and mathematics. Must admit, I still don't like doing math, but you know, it's what it is. But uh, they came along and helped me do that. And even though I had the, the great, and by the way, the Stanleys, we love educators of all kinds. Uh, you High marks from me, without a doubt. But uh, even though the great work of those educators, uh, I still had this fear within me that something would happen, that I would get behind in my work, and that I, that embarrassment would just come back on me again. And so I began to create walls in my life. And some of these walls, uh, well, they came in all kinds of forms, but uh, these walls I thought were there to protect me. Uh, But in reality, what they did is they prevented me from being able to engage in some opportunities, and they also kept people at bay as I would push them back, because again, I was worried about being embarrassed. In reality, uh, what was happening here is that fear began to creep in all areas of my life, and then it began to creep into my spiritual walk. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, It became such that fear began to direct me instead of Jesus Christ directing me. And my dad saw this, and my dad pulled me aside to have a talk with me. And, and dads, if you're here this morning, or men, let me just say men, let me challenge you with this. If your child or grandchild is struggling, you speak into their life. Uh, get equipped in knowing how to have those kinds of conversations with them. Uh, be on point. And if need be, you pull them back from the fire. And if need be, you go into the burning building and you pull them out. But you get out and you have those conversations with your kiddos. Well, again, uh, my dad was uh, noticed this in me um, and pulled me aside to have a conversation with me. My dad was trained as an army ranger, and so he knew a little bit about courage and fear as well. And so he said, Chris, here's the thing. Having a little bit of fear in your life, that's not a bad thing. And having the fear of the Lord in your life, that is a great thing. But here's something that you need to know. The Lord did not give you a spirit of fear, but rather he gave you a spirit of power, love, and self-control. And he said, I want to give you clarity on what Jesus has done for you. And so there he took me into the gospel of Luke. And we went to chapter four. And in chapter four, it speaks of Jesus going into the synagogue. And he's in the synagogue. He opens up the scroll to Isaiah chapter 61. And I'm going to paraphrase a bit, but Jesus basically read this, that he'd come to preach the gospel, to free the captives and release those who have been oppressed And then he concluded by saying, and this has been fulfilled in your hearing. 
And my dad looked at me and he says, at that point, Jesus was laying down the gauntlet and he was letting all evil know, I'm coming for you. I'm coming after you. And he was letting sin and death know, and I'm coming for you as well. Let this be your notice, I'm coming. And then dad looked at me and he said, I believe at that point in time when he finished saying that, that all evil and sin and death ran into the darkness terrified. And then he went on to say, and I'll never forget this. You know, you have those conversations with your dad. Sometimes you just go, yeah, whatever, okay. But this was a time that I've, I have remembered this every day since then. But dad looked at me and he said, Chris, the Lord has saved you. He's giving you a mission and it's gonna require courage to accomplish that mission. So trust him, walk in his ways, and then go for it. Defeat the enemy. And I must admit, as a 12-year-old boy, some of that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Some of it I did. I didn't have a great grasp of it. But as I've gotten older, and I have gotten older, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, as I've gotten older, I have a little bit a better understanding of what he was mentioning. And it's something like this. Uh, we all can develop walls in our life. And sometimes they're well-intentioned trying to protect ourselves. But these walls can take the form of unhealthy thought patterns. They can be addictions. They can be habitual sin. It can be numerous things, but if these are left unchecked, they can develop into strongholds into our spiritual walk that the enemy will use to try to hinder us from knowing uh, the, the life that we have in the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that he can hinder us from knowing salvation in the Lord. That victory has been won through the finished work on the cross. But he wants to thwart us from knowing the fullness of that victory in Jesus. And so we need to not leave these walls unchecked, but we need to demolish them. We need to demolish these strongholds in our life. This morning, our scripture reference is going to tell us how to do that. Uh, what we're going to see this morning is that to do that, we need to focus on Jesus. We need to trust in his instruction. And then we need to demolish those walls. We find this first one that we need to focus on Jesus there in chapter five of Joshua there in verses 13 through 15. A little bit of the background here. What we know is that Israel has come out of captivity from Egypt and they're making their way into the promised land and there to find fulfillment in the promise of victory in the Lord. But standing in the way is a stronghold, the city of Jericho. And the city of Jericho is a heavily fortified city, has a powerful king in it, valiant warriors as scripture tells us, and it has walls that are approximately 15 feet high and about six feet thick. Seems like an impossible task. Some of you may be here this morning and you think the walls in your life are impossible to overcome as well. Hang in there, we have some truth for you. But I get the feeling that as Joshua is uh, preparing for battle, he's thinking about this, he's finding it hard to sleep. So he walks outside and there he's looking at the city of Jericho and he's going over strategy in his mind. He's taking a look at things, the lay of the land. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna handle all this? And then all of a sudden he sees someone walking up has the appearance of a soldier. And their sword is drawn and they're, they're walking up. And then so Joshua responds in verse 13, he says, are you for us? Are you for our adversaries? And I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit here, but the soldier responded, uh, I'm not on anybody's side, I'm here to take over. Sounds a lot like Jesus reading Isaiah 61, doesn't it? but he identifies himself as a captain of the Lord's army. And so the question begs to be answered, who is this that Joshua is having this conversation with? Now, there are those who believe that it's one of the great uh, archangels, maybe Michael, maybe Gabriel. Uh, I believe, uh, along with a lot of biblical scholars, that this is one of the rare pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus Christ. And we get two clues uh, in our scripture reference here this morning uh, why we believe that. The first one is that we see Joshua fall face down in worship. 
And we know that angels all throughout Scripture never receive worship. Matter of fact, we get an example of this in Revelation 19, where John is in heaven and he's being escorted around and he sees all that's going on in heaven and he becomes overwhelmed and he falls at the feet of an angel and begins to worship and the angel scolds him and says, don't worship me, worship the Lord. But here in this instance, we see that this captain of the, arm, or the Lord's host receives Joshua's worship. We also get another clue here as well. It's seen in verse 15. You notice that it's, uh, he's speaking to Josh when he says, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. Now, some of you Bible students, that might sound familiar. You remember when Moses had his encounter with the Lord at the burning bush, he said, Moses, take your sandals off for you are on holy ground. So I believe that uh, what we're seeing here, we get a clear picture that Joshua has encountered the Lord. So if he's encountered the Lord, what is he doing to put his focus on the Lord? And here's where it gets practical for us. Well, the first thing that we've already seen, but let's go back and quickly take a look at his posture. Notice his posture there in verse 14. It says, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and he bowed down. He's again entered into that posture of worship. His focus is no longer on the battle. He's not worried about strategy. He's not looking at the lay of the land, but his focus is totally on the Lord. And we know in our own lives that the day-to-day -day grind can catch up with us, right? There are times that our focus is pulled in uh, 8 million different directions. As a matter of fact, you may have come in this morning, Sunday morning, and you're already thinking about Monday morning. What am I going to do? Or what are we doing this afternoon to get ready for Monday morning? We got to get home and we got to wash clothes. We got to get that project done that you've waited all weekend and you haven't even started yet. So that, yeah, one of the students here is going, uh oh, he's talking about. Uh, but all these things come into play and our focus is just everywhere. And it's just all over the place. But we know at Hebrews 12, we're told to fix our eyes on Jesus. And so when we come together on Sunday morning, and just as we've already done through worship, through song, uh, Dave and the praise team do a wonderful job of leading us to put our focus on Jesus as we sing about his attributes, his characteristics, and what he's done on our behalf. And as we do that, those cares and concerns suddenly just lose focus and they go away. They go off to the side and they leave us. But worship plays a big part in helping us to be able to focus on Jesus. We also see that as Joshua is in this posture, he enters into a posture of prayer as well. Notice also in verse 14, he begins this conversation with the Lord, or just simply he's praying. He says, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Let me ask you, have you discovered that prayer is where the battles are won? Just being on your face before the Lord, that's where the real battle takes place. We get great examples of this in the Gospels. Uh, you'll remember the 12 who were following Jesus, the 12 disciples. They followed him daily uh, for several years. And they noticed a pattern with Jesus, that he would go out and he would do battle. He would shepherd, he would preach, he would teach. Uh, he would heal, he would do all these different things, and at the, uh, when the time came, he would go back, and then he would spend time in prayer to the Father. Next day, he gets up, he goes out, he battles, he preaches, he teaches, he heals, and then he goes back and spends time with the Father. And after a while, it's like the light bulb went on with the disciples, and they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. They figured out that if we're going to be able to do battle, we have to be able to focus in on him. And the way to do that is in prayer. Jesus himself said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask what it is you wish and it will be given to you. Why? Because we're focused in on him and his will and we begin to pray his will into our lives as well. And he's ready 
to give that to us. We also get an example of this in Exodus 17 as well. Moses is leading the Israelites in a battle against the Amalekites. And the battle is taking place in the valley. So Moses goes up on the hilltop to observe the battle to see what's going on there. And as he's doing so, he noticed that the battle is going in a bad way for Israel. And so he begins to pray. And the battle just is going on all day long. And so Moses is growing weary in his prayer. And as he grows weary and he stops praying, the battle goes against Israel. But when he prays, the favor returns and Israel begins to win again. Eventually, Aaron and Hur come along beside him and they join him and they help lift up his arms. And as we do so, again, we see Israel win that battle. And we discover that the battle wasn't really taking place in the valley, but it was taken up, up on the hilltop in prayer. Prayer is powerful in helping us to focus in on the Lord so that we can hear from him. And that leads us to our next thing, that we need to trust his instructions. Notice the instructions that he gives Joshua, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 there. There, beginning of verse one, it says, Now Jericho was tightly shut because the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. In other words, the battle's over. The victory is there to be taken. And he said, With its king and its valiant warriors. Verse three, you shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city at once, and you'll do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Well, we're going to stop right there for a moment. Here we see Joshua has put his focus on the Lord, and as he does so, he receives his instructions on how they're to overcome the stronghold, how the walls are going to come down. And so you could just picture it in Joshua's mind. He's going to give a pep talk to the troops, right? He's going to go in and tell them, this is how this is going to happen. This is what's going to take place. This is what we're going to do. And we see that throughout history, that uh, great speeches are given before battles to encourage those who are facing overwhelming odds. Uh, I must admit to you this morning, I, I did a lot of my growing up in the 80s. Yes, I'm that old. Uh, but in the 80s was kind of the apex of the Cold War between America and its allies and the communist Soviet Union. And a lot of the battles that took place took place in the divided country of Germany. If you remember at one point in time after World War II, Germany was divided in half. America and its allies controlled one part and the communists controlled the other part. And so there was a battle of wills going on within that country. Some of it was economic. A lot of it was just rhetoric and what have you. And eventually, uh, democracy was winning over in the hearts and minds of the people. And so to control the people on their side, the communists built a wall. It divided Berlin and parts of that country. It was 96 miles long. Get this, that wall was approximately 15 feet high and in some places, three to six feet wide. Sound familiar? A little bit. It got me. Um, and so they were doing that to control people and keep them under their thumb. And so President Ronald Reagan went over, and I think at the peak of all this happening, and went to Brandenburg Gate in 1987. It's right in front of the, the wall that was there. And he gave a speech and he was really speaking to the people who were on the other side of the wall, trying to encourage them, to give them hope, to build them up, and to say, look, if this wall comes down, you're going to know more fulfillment in life, but we got to get rid of this wall. And again, at the climax of his speech, he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Didn't happen immediately, but a couple of years later, due to extreme efforts of America and its allies, that wall did come down. Families were reunited, friends got back together, and there they experienced the fullness of life once again. So, okay, picture Joshua. He's gotten these instructions from the Lord, okay? 
So he's going in to talk to his generals. And he's like, look, guys, the battle's coming up. Uh, I've gotten these instructions. I don't want to relay these to you. Uh, they're excited about that. They're like, they're hungry. They're ready. They know they got to get through Jericho to get into the promised land. And so they're all gathered around. He said, look, here's what we're going to do. First day. We're going to give the, the priests together and we're going to give them horns and they're going to march in front of the army and we're going to march around Jericho in silence that first day. And they go, okay, it's a little odd, a little different, but all right, you know, doing some reconnaissance, I guess, find some weak points, we'll figure out how to get it. Okay, well, what are we going to do on day two? Well, on day two, we're going to do exactly the same thing. And day three, day four, day five, and day six, we're going to do exactly the same thing. But on day seven, we're going to march around the city seven times. And then at the end of that seventh time, the priests are going to blow their horn, the people are going to shout, the walls are going to come down, and then we're going to march on into victory. Now, you can just picture their faces, right? Joshua, what? Here's what archaeologists have told us. They said it would take about two hours to march around Jericho. Now, I have dyslexia, but I can do that math, all right? Two hours. So every day for about a week, they're marching two hours. But on the day of the battle, 14-hour march before they even go into battle. Again, you can just picture their faces going, Joshua, man, you're not making sense. You need to go take a nap or eat a sandwich or something. You know, what is this? And my thought goes to, what if they hadn't been obedient to the Lord's instructions, even though it didn't seem to make sense? There would have been no victory. Who knows, those walls might still be up today. But we do know that they followed his instructions and those walls came down. Now, I must admit, there are things in Scripture, we get our instructions from the Word, and I must admit, there are times when I'm looking at things to speak how I'm to walk in Christ and how I'm to live for Him, that sometimes these things don't make sense. Matter of fact, there was a, a friend who came to me the other day, and he wanted to talk about tithing. You're going, uh oh, here he goes. We knew that was coming somewhere in here, right? Okay, but he wanted to come talk to me about tithing. And he said, Chris, he, he says, the Lord wants me to get a percentage of my income to him, right? And I'm like, right. And then the percentage that's left over, he's going to bless it, and it's going to go further than if I held on everything, right? I was like, right. And he said, well, my CPA told me that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and if you think about it, it doesn't seem to make sense, but it works. It's truth. Ask anybody who ties, it is true. And we always know that the world has opposing opinions to the Lord's instructions, to his truth. Uh, see if some of these sound familiar to you. The world says, follow your heart. But the Lord says, follow me. The world says, well, just believe in yourself. Sounds like a good Texas saying, doesn't it? You know, believe in yourself. You can do it. Pull, pull yourself up by your bootstrap. Get out there. Make it happen. Believe in yourself. And the Lord says, no, believe in me. The world says, okay, well, well, how about this one? Live your truth. Does that sound familiar? Boy, we're seeing a whole lot of that now, right? Live your truth. And Jesus says, I am the truth. The world says, okay. Well, how about this? Just do whatever makes you happy as long as you're not hurting anybody else. How about that one? You know, you just do your thing, you be you, and if it makes you happy and you're not hurting anybody, what's the harm? Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus says, what good is it if it makes you happy and causes you to forfeit your soul? You know, the world has a way of making things sound kind of good, right? It, it, it sounds almost right, almost sounds good. But in reality, for us to know the fullness of life that Christ has for us and for us to be able to take down these walls in our life, the instructions that we have are right here in his word. And that is what we need. In Isaiah 55, the Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. 
But also in Psalm 119, it says that your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. When you lean into the instructions of the Lord, when you're digging into his word, several things begin to happen. One is you get a better picture of what the Lord is doing in your life. As God is filling you with this truth, as his Holy Spirit is directing you from that truth and you take steps of obedience and walking in him, you get the idea that the Lord is looking to make you a holy person who can be in fellowship with him. As you, again, take on his truth, as you walk in his ways, you develop spiritual perseverance. As you walk in his truth and do these battles to bring these walls down in your life, that faith becomes genuine because it's been tested and you know it's real and you know his truth is real because it's led you through it. And again, we see these walls come down. Well, the last thing that we see here, we're going to close with this, is that we need to demolish these walls. We see this in verse 5. Look in chapter 6, verse 5, what he says there. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, speaking of the priest, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead." You know, when I get to heaven, I'm not going to hear the Lord say, Chris, well thought out, good and faithful servant, or well planned, good and faithful servant. What I want him to hear him say is what? Well done, good and faithful servant. We need to be actively engaged in tearing down these walls, tearing down these strongholds in our life. We read in scripture that on the seventh day that Israel marched around Jericho seven times, 14 hours, they marched. The priests blew their horn, the people shouted, and the walls came down. Obedience produced victory. And just as the walls of Jericho come tumbling down by the Lord's power, you know, in our own life, it's possible as well. The Apostle Paul speaks to this in 2 Corinthians 10. Notice what he says. For though we live in the, uh, the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul tells us that we're not capable of tearing down these strongholds and these walls in our life by our own wisdom, by our own sheer willpower, or just by any human effort. Those are the weapons of the worldly. But rather, our weapons are spiritual. We know that scripture tells us that we've been equipped with the belt of truth, that we've been given the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel, the shield of the faith, the helmet of salvation, and that we are to wield the sword of the spirit in our battles. Spiritual goals require spiritual means to achieve them. And we know the Lord provides those for us to demolish these walls. Uh, in my office, uh, I keep a hymnal in the top right hand of my drawer. And as part of my devotional life, every morning I'll go in, I'll pull that hymnal out, and I'll open it up to a hymn, just something that just catches my eye. And silently, because I don't want anybody else to hear me sing. It, it, yeah, it's, it's that way. There's a reason I'm not in the choir or praise team, right? Uh, but I'll just silently uh, uh, sing this hymn to myself. And it causes me to be able to focus in on the Lord and be able to hear from him and his word. And there is a particular hymn, and it's on page 475 of my hymnal. And it's written by a gentleman named Ian Bartlett. And it was written in 1937. But when I tell you the title, I think you're going to know it. It's called Victory in Jesus. You know that one? Some of you do. 
Uh, it goes something like this. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. Um, it says, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him, because he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. There's a great theologian named A.W. Tozer, and he was speaking about this hymn and winning battles in our life. And he said this about Christians in those spiritual battles. He said, Christians don't usually go into the church and tell lies, but they will go in the church and sing about them. Yeah, that kind of hit me, to be honest with you. You know, are, are we willing to sing about these, these uh, victories that we have in Jesus, but we're keeping the battle off to the side? We're going, you know what? I'm just going to keep this stronghold over here uh, by sheer willpower. I'm not going to let it come into this area of my life. We'll just keep it quiet, keep it silent. Don't tell anybody about it. Not going to speak about it. But you know what? Battling that fear, battling that anxiety or that addiction or that habit, that sinful habit, whatever it is, you know what? I just don't have it in me. I'm just going to keep it over here. But on Sunday, I'll come in here and I'll sing that hymn or I'll sing that praise song about victory in Jesus and I'll go along with that. And Tozer would go, no. The scripture reference we have here today would say, no. Jesus would look at you and say, no. You demolish those walls you be actively engaged in demolishing those walls. Ephesians 4.27 says, do not give the devil a foothold. If we don't demolish those walls, the enemy will look to take every inch, take every brick and build upon it to develop a stronghold in your spiritual walk. Not because he can thwart your salvation, but because he doesn't want you to know the fullness of the victory that was won on the cross for you. Uh, there's a story that comes out of Haiti, and I'm, I'm really going to close this time with this. A uh, story that comes out of Haiti, and it's uh, about an evil man who owns this beautiful home. Gorgeous. Everybody in the town loved it. Uh, just thought it was uh, just a, a gorgeous uh, space and uh, just met your needs and what have you. And so the evil man decided he wanted to sell it. And everybody uh, came around, he told them the price, and they were like, no, can't afford that, can't do that, uh, that's too much. Uh, and so uh, the evil guy started thinking about it, and he's like, okay, I, I, I figured out a way I can make some money off of this. So the next guy comes up, and he says, hey, look, this home would be perfect for my family, but I'm not really sure that I can afford this price you're asking. And the evil man said, hey, I tell you what, I'll sell it to you for half price. Here's the only stipulation. There's a nail over the front door, and I want to retain ownership of that nail. But I'll sell you the whole house for half price. The guy was like, well, great, I could do that. You're not so bad after all. I don't know why everybody's saying you're such an evil guy. You know, I can, the half price that fits my budget, I can do that. I don't even need a realtor. Uh, I'll make that happen. So he, he pays for the house outright. He and his family, they move in. Uh, they're there for a week. And then all of a sudden, here's a knock at the door. And it's the, the evil man. And he, he comes up and he says, hey, I want to buy the house back. And I want to buy it back for 500 bucks. Guy says, you're crazy. I can't take you five hundred dollars to sell you the house. That's not gonna happen. He said, that's you know, less than a third of what I paid for it. I'd be homeless and out of luck and whatever. The evil man said, Okay, that's fine. Turns around, walks away, and he goes out into the community and he finds the carcass of a dead dog. And he picks up that dog and he drags it over to the house and he hangs it on that nail over the door. And as you can imagine, as that dog continues to decay, that smell just goes all throughout the house, just permeates it, just permeates it. And eventually the man goes back to the guy and he's like, look, you win. I can't do this anymore. We can't handle this. I'll sell you the house back. It's yours. Friends, here's the moral of that story. Again, we've already said it. If you give him an inch, he'll take every part of it and he'll use it 
to hang that dead carcass, that rotting carcass, that rotting garbage on the home of your life so that you cannot know the fulfillment of the life that Christ has for you because of his finished work on the cross. You've got to demolish those walls.